Well, where the concept came from, the Navy, you know, an aircraft carrier, going into a harbor, it's completely fogged in, you can't see anything. You get a one point navigational fix off a lighthouse, say. Chances are you're going to be successful. So that, in a way, is like buying a low P stock, period. You know, um, but then if you get another buoy, you can shoot off of that, you get two fixes. So that's like adding a story to the valuation. And then the ideal thing in navigational terms, to get the third fix, you get the third fix, you go into the harbor, no matter how fogged in you are, you're going to be successful. And that's where you get something that's out of favor, as well as the other two. And that's where that came from. Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode, Jack and I sit down with Jim Collin, Chairman and CEO of Schaefer Collin Capital Management to discuss his book, The Case for Long-Term Value Investing. For roughly a decade following the great financial crisis, buying statistically cheap stocks was not a market winning approach. But in the book, Jim looks at stock market history to show the effectiveness of long-term value investing and the strategies and metrics he looks at when buying value stocks. The best performing stocks have something Jim calls the three point fix, which is analogous to a concept captains use when trying to navigate into a foggy port. Successful investing doesn't need to be overly complicated, and Jim discusses a value strategy his firm has been implementing for nearly 40 years. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Schaefer Cullen Capital Management's Jim Cullen. Hi, Jim. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, good seeing you. You recently published uh, a new book, The Case for Long-Term Value Investing, and we're going to get into a lot of these value investing topics that you outlined in the book. But before we do that, I think it would be good just to, you know, maybe learn a little bit more about you, your background and your firm, Schaefer Cullen uh, Capital Management. Um, I think you guys have been in business uh, maybe over 40 years at this point. Um, we started in yeah, 85. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought maybe to start, it's like, you know, you, you've obviously survived many different types of market environments. You probably have done that through a lot of discipline and with the very good team you've built an investment process. But what I wanted to just sort of ask you out of the gate here is, you know, can you can you share sort of maybe the story of the firm, how it got started? And, and maybe more importantly, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned in running money and building a money management business over that period of time? Uh, I start in the book a, um, a chapter which is called background instead of an introduction. I use the term background and I point out that I was an uh, officer in the Navy, sitting on an aircraft carrier, investing a little bit of money, and I was 1961, 65, market was going up, everything everything worked. And I said, this is, this is great, this is fun, it's easy, you know. And uh, I got out in 1965 and started with Merrill Lynch. They had a new office, which was out on Wall Street. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, it was, Wall Street was just excitement. The uh, our office every day was filled up with people, and I got so many people were in the office, we had to put up a plexiglass to sort of separate the crowd coming in every day versus the brokers. And that was going on throughout the country. And uh, this is the 60s. And you think of it today, it's, it's a completely different scenario. But uh, um, And that was the way it started. There was all kinds of mad, the conglomerates were uh, leverage companies, uh, letter stock, um, and it was a very, very speculative environment. And then all of a sudden, 68, it sort of rolled over. And uh, so and then 75, you really had a another serious drop in the market. So you had two major drops in the first five years I was in the business. And uh, so between 65 and 75, uh, the whole thing unwound. All those brokerage offices on Main Street were shut down. And um, Wall Street, which was the most popular place in the world, was des was deserted. Um, and uh, so that was the start. And actually, well, I think you've had on your program Dave Dreamman. Dave Dreamman was at J and W Seligman, and I was at uh, uh, Spencer Trasking Company. And uh, Spencer Trasking Company specialized in 
uh, the highest multiple technology stocks around. So we, re we realized that what, what we were doing before wasn't working, so we started our own firm at that point. And then my eventual partner, Schaefer, he was at uh, Value Line with Dreamin at that time. And uh, so we had a um, phenomenal track record over that top period. He had a hard, a hard time getting people to follow you because everybody was still excited over IBM, Xerox, Polaroid, and those stocks. Um, so that was the beginning. And uh, but the first ten years, and I was you, you, I, you know, we were all millennials, all most of us. And uh, so I look at what's going on today, and I'm saying a lot of these people are going to have the same kind of experience, probably somewhere along the way. And uh, so when we start the book, we go into the history of the last hundred years, and what it shows you is that up and down, up and down. The, you know, um, so the most important thing when we were putting the book together. When I was putting the book together, I said, what do you do first, the strategy? Or do you tell people how difficult the, the markets are? So I said, let's start off by saying a history of the market and gives uh, the investor an idea how difficult it is. Then you say, okay, well, I've got the cure for that volatility, and that's a strategy. Um, so that was, uh, so, and then I started working in 19, Dreaming and I did that for, for a while, and then I was with a, uh, uh, Donaldson, Lofkin, and Jenrette, uh, 1980, 80, 81 to 85. And then Schaefer was running a little money over at International Nickel. So we decided then to hook up at that point, so 1985. And, um, you know, th we started off with just the simple value strategy, value discipline. And the ideas for the strategy came basically, we're talking back in 1975 when Wall Street was basically was shut down. Two things happened. Uh, ben Graham gave a speech, and nobody cared about what anybody had to say at that point. There was no interest in the market, but it was his final speech that he gave. And what he pointed out is, is basically was saying a lot of the stuff that he had covered in his books was no longer that applicable. And he thought investing would be made a lot simpler by just being a long-term investor and having a discipline. He said the disciplines of PE, price to book, and dividend yield, those three disciplines. He said if you do that, you can probably forget about everything else. So when we started investing, we said, okay, let's look at interest rate spiking, recessions, bear markets, what have you. Can you really forget that? Well, it turns out that he was right. And the only thing, he didn't give you a framework for time. Uh, so what we did was we said, okay, let's use a five-year time period. So if you take the history of all the strategies going back to, the, we started in 1968. You take the history there and you, see the years up and down on very volatile years and yearly and um but if you smooth it towards every five years for the whole period um, all the negatives are wiped out and no matter how bad it is and uh so that's what you know constantly we said okay here's the way to invest with a discipline make sure you have a five-year time horizon and if we can get clients to, to focus on a five-year time period and we get through you through that Chances are you're going to become a believer, because what happens in every single five-year time period, nearly something going on. In fact, we have in the book that we have one chapter that you know I think we thought it works, and we took all the started 1968 right through to now, and we took all the five-year periods, and we took all the recessions and bear markets, and did a five-year performance for value discipline that over the same time period, every single five-year period had some major negatives. And but it wiped them all out. So even later on, we're writing even what we're talking about now, bear markets, recessions. Um, you worry about oh my God, if you what are we going to do and what have you. But even go, go, covers all those areas. So um, the uh, I think you had three or four year rolling five year periods where the results were less than five percent annual. But then if you look what happened the next five years after that, a dramatic. 20, 25, 35% increases annually for the next five years. So the strategy works, and it's hard to get people to stick with it. And um, we have a, we have a chapter in the doctors. We had a, when I was a, when I was at Spencer Trask, the uh, we had a bunch of doctors who started, and they had the the, the IRA plans. And they could put twenty five thousand a year in the IRAs, and I pointed out how. Um, a 
lot of them were doing that. It was irrelevant money to them. And they all went on to make a lot of money and they had a lot of big investments later on. And But the one doctor made sure they all stuck with their IRA plans. And all of a sudden, 50 years later, the uh, they've gone in the business where they've been selling hotels, restaurants, fancy cars, big houses, what have you. And uh, But they didn't touch the IRA plans. All the other investments are gone. Usually second wives or third wives finish that off. And um, and then these, these, their accounts are worth like $30, $40 million just from the simple IRA plans. And um, so if people stick with the strategy, the lessons are there. And, um, you know, so that's, you know, where we're, you know, where we're coming from. That's what we preach all the time. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And that, that's one thing that I, I sort of can appreciate with the beginning of the book, which is, you know, you're talking about sort of the history of the market going back, I think, to the 1920s. And to your point, you know, there was always, there's always something to worry about. You can look at each decade and pinpoint, you know, the one, two, three big blow up events that, of course, investors were panicking about. But like you emphasized um, that, you know, the markets come back, like Graham said, you need to think long term. Um, and, you know, with your focus on sort of value investing in particular, um, I think that really resonates with a lot of our listeners because a lot of them are hopefully still value investors. Um, and just one point of cl uh, just clarification, we actually have never had Dremen on the podcast. We run a strategy based on his book, Contrarian Investment Strategies. Um, so so um, that's one of the models, the models we run. Um, but I want to ask you in terms of, um, you know, helping clients I guess, make it through those tough periods. Is it establishing it up front? Listen, we only want you to think about this in increments of five years or longer. We don't, you know, how do you, I guess, get the right clients on the bus or make sure that the right clients on the bus? Because unless you have those, unless you have those clients invested with you, are, are they going to be able to make it through the tough periods? I mean, you need to do, what is it? Is it education? Is it educating them about your strategy? I mean, how do you go about doing that? Well, just basically what the you know examples of what we mentioned in the book here. Um, if you put the, the 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 facts in front of people, um, you know, it gets you started. But it's hard to. Um, I say to them, um, I say I'll guarantee you in the next five years, you're going to get a period. You're going to come in here, and you're going to say, what the hell am I doing in value, or what am I doing in the market, or both. And I said, you know, then that's when we try to get you through that period. What happened in 2000, you know, which was similar to this period we had here where uh, the market was up, it had, the, the, the growth stocks were up dramatically and value was down that one. We call it a pivotal year. And uh, we were getting fired all over the place. And uh, so I was getting to the point where I said, when people would call, I would say, just sell half. <laughs> you know, just sell half. <laughs> I knew they were gonna get out, but, uh, and uh, probably was successful with uh, maybe a third of them, or they only sold half. Maybe not, maybe not that much, but it was. Uh, um, but once the momentum gets so strong, and uh, people want to be on the same bus that they're, I, I remember along the lines one family we were working with, and the woman calls me up, and we had had a great run with them, and uh, the one woman called me up, and she says the family picked me as the one to call you on this. She said, um, you know, you've done a great job for us over the last 15 years. I'm really happy with it. But the, uh, some of our neighbors, very wealthy family out in uh, mid the Midwest, some of our neighbors, children are doing so much, or the neighbors are doing so much better for their children than we are for our children. So we're going to have to fire you. <laughs> she, she drew the short straw on that one, I guess. <laughs> so that's what happens. That's the way people think. And uh, so getting through that period is tough. Um, it's probably a lot tougher now because the, uh, <clears throat> in our business, a lot of our business is dealing with the brokers. The brokers are keeping more of that business themselves and they're, we're getting cut out of a lot of that relationship business. Uh, so it's a little more difficult. But. 
You mentioned bear markets, and I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that because, as you mentioned, you, you do, in the beginning of the book, you talk a lot about market history. And you know, one of the things you're seeing right now is a lot of people are trying to find like the perfect analog for what we're in right now. So they'll look to the 1970s because we have inflation, or they'll look to 2000 because we had overvalued tech stocks, or the people that think we're about to have a huge crisis will look to 2008. I'm just wondering, what do you think we can learn from past bear markets? You know, what do you think we should learn, and what do you think we shouldn't learn when we look back and try to find the bear market that perfectly compares to what we're in now? Well, they're always going to play out differently to a certain extent. The one thing that shocks me is that you take 1920s, you take the 70s, you take the tech bubble, and not all about now. Um, but in every single case, and we point this out in the book, once the market finally rolls over, it's not a five-year period. It's like 10 years. The mar these stocks are a lot lower, 10 years. First example we had was in uh, the 70s bubble. We had, I remember buying uh, IBM and, 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 and Avon products back in 1985. And these stocks in 75 were selling at, you know, 73, were selling at, you know, 60, 70 times earnings. Also, we were able to buy them at seven or eight times earnings with a five or six percent dividend yield. Meanwhile, the results of the business was very good through all those periods. In the same way, you go back a little RCA in the 20s. Their business was phenomenal for the next 10 years. But the stock went from 150 to five, and the same way with uh, you know the tech stocks, um, you know the. Um, um, so now what you don't know is um, the Fang stocks. Uh, although you're starting to see some of them come down a lot more than people thought they would. Um, I know um, Barry Diller is probably one of the savviest guys around, and he, they asked him about Facebook at one point. Uh, no, Netflix, at uh, Netflix, and he says, they have such a lead on everybody. He says, one stock you're never going to have to worry about. He says, they got such a lead. But the way that stock has come down, and uh, it's, one of the, you know what it is, the phenomena, when, when the bear market finally kicks in, is all of a sudden, where everybody is buying a stock because it's going up, and all the news is good, and that's all you hear about on TV all the time, on the real, on NBC, what have you. But then all of a sudden, one of the, once it, to rolls over and you finally get a period where everybody in the stock has got a loss in it. That becomes pretty powerful. And um, and that's what's happening now in some of these stocks. And even though the, even though the fundamentals may be okay, but uh, all of a sudden everybody has a loss in them. And uh, so if you keep getting corrections, people are gonna re react to that. So you never know how low some of these things can go. Um, but, um, but eventually they've come back to where they've been value stocks. Yeah. You kind of, you kind of see that with all these tech eras, you know, they, they become these tech leaders or growth stocks. And then eventually, you know, o over time they finally come down and, you know, you see them come into value portfolios and, you know, the FANG stocks are not at that point yet. I don't think, but you know, you do see from previous generations, some of the, some of the high growth stocks from 2000 are in a lot of value portfolios right now. And these are the high quality stocks. I mean, you have all the junk that goes along with it on the side, you know, in the 60s, we had letter stock. I didn't forget what letter stock was. It was like sort of like what's going on today with uh, you know some of the um, strategies. But to set the stage before we start, I, I want to just talk about you know one of the concepts throughout the book is how great a, val a strategy value investing is over the long term. And just to set the stage before we start, I was wondering if you could just talk about maybe some of the advantages, some of the long term evidence. You know why value investing is such a good strategy over the long term. Well, I think just the fact that it's the fact that earnings go up over, over a long period of time, this market goes up because earnings go up. And so if you're paying a low price for those earnings and the quality of the company is halfway decent, you're going to have an edge. And that's basically what it is. And we have, we cover in the book, I think, where earnings have doubled going back to 1920s. Every 10 years, earnings double. So if you're, you're, you're paying a low multiple for that, uh, those stocks, um, you just have to be careful you have the right stocks and what have you and the fundamentals. And we go into, we have a chapter, as you know, on, on trying to pick the stocks, which is an inexact science, but, um, um, but that's, you know, um, but I, you know, I don't know how that answers your question, Rob, but that's sort of. Yeah, no, it does. You know, and you know, one of the things for me that I've always liked about value investing is this idea that I'm, I don't have to meet very high, ultra high expectations in the stocks I'm owning. So, you know, that, that tends to be one of the problems with growth, I think. And then we're sort of seeing that now is, is eventually, 
you know, th those stocks kind of fall under those expectations because they get so lofty. But with, with value, I think you, you end up with a more reasonable set of expectations as a starting point. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, we, uh, and what you want, actually, the ideal we have in the, in the book there, we'll call it three point fix. The ideal is something out of favor, uh, as well as being cheap, as well as having a story, those three things. But those three things together, you're going to be really do well. And that's our research people. That's what I preach every day. I said, you've got, you got to find something where all three of those things, we can get them. Usually, sometimes you can't get all three, you get two or three maybe. But. Um, one of the points you made in the book was, was this idea of focusing on risk and not just performance. Um, and you introduced this concept called risk-adjusted alpha. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk about sort of the importance of risk and also talk about this concept of risk-adjusted alpha. Yeah, well, I think um, on risk, uh, I remember, I think I mentioned in the book, <clears throat> the first meeting I had one at Merrill Lynch, I'm going to a meeting with someone who's presenting five mutual funds in front of a, a committee. And um, it's a very highly um, no, well-known committee, very intellectual crowd. And so I'm sitting there watching this thing, my first meeting. And uh, they look at the five different mutual funds. One fund's dramatically better than all the others. And the guy, one of the, one of the committee members said, why wouldn't we choose that one? And they chose that one. Well, what happened, they had the, the best one, three, five year numbers. And uh, but what we thought they found out was they had those numbers because it was the most aggressive stocks in the portfolio and it was leveraged. And that's, that's what happens, I think, with a lot of the institutional business that's done today. They're still using the one, three, five year ways to evaluate companies. And that's why most of your pension funds are uh, you know, struggling to a certain extent. But Whenever I think about a story like that, I always think about, you're probably familiar with Janus 20 back in the day. Um, do you remember them? Like that was the one that every, everybody wanted to invest in, everybody wanted to chase, and you know, everybody loved the performance. And then unfortunately we saw the other side of that coin. In, that's funny. In New York, when you're going to the Holland Tunnel or the Lincoln Tunnel, they had a great big sign, Janus 20. <laughs> so you got banged over the head with it, no matter where you looked. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people sort of compare that to ARC these days. I mean, we'll see, we'll see if the ending for the ARC funds is, is the same or if it's different, but you know, a lot of people sort of have drawn some parallels between those, between those funds. Um, before we talk about the actual value strategy you talk about in the book, I want to ask you about the struggles of value. You know, obviously the last couple of years have gone a lot better, but before that we had a decade where value struggled a lot. And a lot of people started to question whether value works anymore. You know, some people said it doesn't work in a world of technology. Some people said there are too many value investors and they're bidding up the stocks. I mean, I just wanted to see if you could maybe put that in context. And is, is, did you see anything in that period that made you question value at all? Or, or do you think that's just another one of those underperforming periods that's common to value and that you need to follow through, you know, with in order to get the long term benefits? Yeah, you're always going to, you know, that seesaw goes back and forth all the time. You get um, once the market becomes really preoccupied with one area, whether it's technology or whether it's nifty 50 or whether it's fang, uh, the value stocks are stocks that are selling lower price that are boring, boring stocks get left behind. So they become cheaper automatically. And um, so then they become more expensive later on, maybe, but the value gets popular again. Um, but then the cycle re sort of somehow repeats itself. And, uh, but usually when value underperforms, it usually doesn't do it that, that, by that much. Um, but when they outperforms, it, it, it's considerable usually. How do you think about like getting into sort of how you define value? In the book, you used price to book, you used a PE, and you used uh, dividend yield. Um, sort of as your metrics. I mean, is that sort of how you think is like a starting point in terms of how, how to define value? Yeah, we started with just value. And that's when, when you know, um, um, the early studies were just on value and what have you. Then we found that adding the PE discipline gave you more downside protection. So that was back in 1990, when all of a sudden value wasn't doing well, because you had a lot of the financial stocks or value stocks. And, uh, but we added the PE discipline and that gave you just dramatically more downside protection. Then if you had PE, uh, the dividend rather, if you had dividends that were growing, growing dividend yields, that was the ideal. So that's been the most popular strategy we have today is the high dividend strategy, which is, you know, the combination of low PE, high dividend yield and dividend growth, which is very important. And I think the, uh, the last 15 years, dividend av average annual dividend growth it's been about 10% a year. So if you do that, when that came, uh, it was illustrated during the dead decade, 1900, uh, 1920, let's say, 
to the you know, the uh, 19, 1900, 1920, a dead decade there, 10 to 20 rather, um, when you had the uh, um, financial crisis, you had 9-11, and you had the tech stocks peaked during that 10-year period there. Uh, market was down over that 10-year period, about, about 8%. And because dividend growth, if you look at the dividends on the, the yield, high dividend portfolio in the beginning of that period was five and a half, no, three and a half percent dividend yield. But after on the 10th year, it was about eight and a half. So what happens is the dividend increases keep working up. And, uh, and we have, in fact, we have in the book where the shocking thing was in all, every single one of the recessions going back over the last 60 years, dividends have gone up in every single recessionary period. Earnings go down, um, but dividends keep going up during that period, uh, which is surprising. So, more so in the U.S. than anyplace else. Um, but that's why we're, we're big fans of dividend increases and not buybacks. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, no, buybacks have been subject of uh, some pretty significant criticism recently. Um, I want to ask you about um, intangible assets. So, you know, price to book is one of the metrics you're using. It's, it's one of the metrics we use in, one, in some of our strategies as well. And, you know, it's been under fire recently and it's been under fire because people are saying, you know, a lot of the assets that exist now are intangible. So, you know, if you think about Google, like the value of its search engine or the, the value of its brand or something like that. And so people have kind of said, you know, in a world where there's so many of these intangible assets, you can't use a metric like price to book. And, and I'm wondering if you could just comment on that and how you think price to book works sort of in, in the modern world. I mean, we look at price to book for every single company, but we know that for most of them, it's you know, it's um, you know, it's, it's relevant. Uh, for certain industries, of course, price to book becomes worth worth a lot more. Um, but um, so the surprising thing is, though, if you look at our yearly numbers, I would have thought that the last five years, price to book would have dramatically trailed everything, but actually held up pretty well. I don't know why that is. Um, but I would have thought that price to book, but we don't use it that much. But we'll use it for certain industries, and um, you know, but not any the metals industries and the some of the financial stocks, what have you. But, uh, but you know, but we have a chapter on price to book in there. We said you know, it's not, even though it was mentioned as one of the disciplines, it's not really pertinent today. You know, for most industries. I'm wondering, as we sort of talk about these these valuation metrics, one of the things I wondered is, you know, we, we mentioned before when we were talking before we recorded that we're quantitative value investors. And so as a starting point, we sort of have these screens, you know, where we're filtering based on or sorting based on all these sort of standard valuation metrics. And I'm wondering, have you seen any impact on that on the market? You know, there's a lot of quant funds out there these days that are just buying cheap value stocks based on, you know, more of a statistical, you know, quantitative system. And I'm wondering, is that me? Have you seen any impact for someone who's a discretionary investor like you in terms of we're pushing up, you know, maybe the cheap stocks aren't as cheap because of, of that? Or, or have you seen anything like that that maybe is an impact of quant investing on what you do? Well, I don't, I, you know, what we focus on is, you know, we're always looking at the bottom 20% of stocks on whatever universe it is. S&P 500, value line, what have you. <clears throat> and um, so a lot of times, pretty hard to beat that universe itself. It can be difficult to beat. We think we want to pick out the cheapest stocks within that universe, because we have concentrated portfolios, 30, 35 stocks in a portfolio. But um, but there is some points to be made for um, certain markets. Uh, you're going to get, what happens is some of the small cap stocks and some of the most leveraged stocks will explode off of market bottoms. And so that'll make the numbers look a lot better for the, you know, for the, for the group. So that can come into play with what you're talking about. Do you, uh, one of the things you criticize a lot in the book is this idea, and we're, we're seeing it a lot right now with people, is this idea of market timing. And the idea that, you know, when things get ugly like they get right now, you know, I need to sell, I need to go to cash for a little bit, and then I'll get, I'll get back in when things seem better. And, and I'm wondering if you could just talk about that and talk about how damaging market timing can be to a portfolio. Yeah, I mean, the history is amazing. We have about seven or eight examples, I think, where showing how it doesn't work. One classic I use is two investors started with us, high, high profile investors, the same day. Um, 20 years later, one investor came in <clears throat> once a year. We had lunch, and that was it. Talked a little bit about the market. The other, periodically, very savvy investor, periodically get out of the market when 9 11, they got 25, 30% out. There were five or six times over the 20-year periods where they got out. 
Um, <clears throat> so after the 20 years, I was just out of curiosity, what's the difference in performance? And the one where they didn't touch anything was up a thousand percent, and the other was up a thousand five hundred percent. The other was up five hundred percent. So it was a thousand percent difference over that twenty-year period in performance. So you can do a lot of studies that will show the same kind of thing where market timing has been, you know, really works against you. Yeah, you know, it's a uh, it's interesting. Like that's probably the the biggest. You know, the role of emotion in investing is probably the the biggest thing that damages you know long-term returns of investors. And you know, we're we're definitely, as we mentioned, we're kind of seeing that right now. Um, you know, during, during these times of panic, it's the hardest time to hold, but, you know, Fidelity did a study, and I don't know if this may have been discredited, it may not exist, but, you know, it's one of those things that was out in the media a lot, is Fidelity did a study, and supposedly the accounts at Fidelity that had the best performance were the accounts where people forgot they had the accounts at Fidelity, um, be, because, because effectively the people were never checking it, they were never making any changes, and they just stayed the course, so. That makes sense. Yeah, there's probably, a, whether, the, whether the study's true or not, there's probably a lesson um, in that. <laughs> we have another one, Fidelity. There's another controversial fidelity study. The average investor lost money over time, even though the performance was phenomenal, because people tend to get in and get out at the wrong time. So while well, the performance was phenomenal, the average investor's performance wasn't that good at all, and it averaged out not so uh, not so good. I think that's uh, Peter Lynch with Magellan. I think what he said was, you know, your average investor, because everyone was piling in after these periods of great performance, and then the performance would cool off and everyone would sell. You know, so even Lynch, who was the best mutual fund manager potentially ever, is saying, you know, a lot of investors lost a lot of money. And, and Fidelity tried to bury that study. <laughs> and I, I remember, I think the biggest example of this was, I don't know if you remember CGM Focus back in the day, um, but uh, Ken Hebner, I think, that, that fund had something like a 20% plus annualized return for, for a long period of time. But the investor return, the average return realized by investors was less than zero. Um, and it was for that exact reason. It was a very volatile fund and people were chasing it when it was hot and they were bailing when it was down. And so they lost 20% plus a year, you know, compared to the performance of the fund, just based on that type of behavior. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. The psycho, the psychology of the markets, you know, was the whole thing. What did I get on the, uh, we have in there the tool mania and the, uh, Isaac Newton lost all his money in the tools. And after he lost all his money, he said, he said, I can calculate the movement of the stars, but not the madness of men. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Shift, shifting back to your strategy, um, you know, one of the things we can always learn as quantitative investors is we can learn a lot from people like you who take it a step further, you know, who use maybe these, these sorts and these quantitative things as a starting point, but then you apply a strategy beyond that that, that you know, involves human discretion and making a decision as to what's a good value. And I'm wondering if you could maybe just talk at a high level before we get into some of the details about that, about what you think the benefits of that are. What do you think the benefits are of not just stopping, you know, at the PE ratio or at, at other metrics? What are the benefits of having a person look at these companies and, and decide, you know, whether it's worth investing in? Well, I don't know how much value it adds, quite frankly. I mean, I think it adds, you know, uh, um, if I'm a customer, I'd like to hear that you're adding something besides just the number, you know. Um, but it's, um, I think, you know, some of the biggest moves you get in stocks, though, will be where I think you yeah, bring in extra research. And, uh, you know, we have, um, and can, can come from different places. The, uh, I have in there, the one of the more interesting moves we had was on uh, Canadian National, the railroads. And um, <clears throat> I the title of, of, the, of the chapter is, um, you know, leads leads them to believe that uh, the uh, the the treasurer for our firm or analyst, our firm research director, was interviewing the the, uh, the analyst who was following International Nickel, and he said, you know, uh, after the meeting was a lunch, we had a luncheon, and after the luncheon was over, he said, oh by the way, which is the name of the chapter, he said, oh by the way, you know, he says the uh, uh, Canadian government's getting rid of those railroads up there. And uh, we just made a lot of money with the U.S. railroads. You realize how efficient they could be if they're really inefficient. Inefficient. And I think we made about five or six hundred percent on our money by picking up on that story and theme and what have you. So that pays. It shows you pays to get out and look around somewhat. And but uh, but the, the quantitative is can be hard to beat. One of the important things that you emphasize is is sort of trying to understand trying to understand the story behind the companies you're investing in. Um, and it sort of reminds me, um, 
speaking of Lynch, uh, he was interviewed in Barron's. I think it might have been like two or three years ago. And obviously fundamentals and like looking at the financials and the valuation and the growth rates are very important to Lynch. But he really drove home this this idea of, you know, understanding the story, understanding what is going on at the company and being able to articulate that as an investor, knowing what you're investing in. So what are, are are there any ways that you can evaluate like the quality of a company story that you, you and your firm, do you guys sit around a table and is it sort of discussing what you're seeing in the market? I mean, how does that actually work in the investment process? Well, one thing example is, is, man, is management. And we mentioned in, in the book, management, Jamie Dimon, you know, J, JP Morgan. And, uh, you know, uh, Mark Hurd was at National Cash. And uh, the, um, so what happens though, one thing, one thing we didn't mention in the book is that when great management leaves also, it's probably a, a signal also, you probably better be careful. But um, Iger, remember, was, came in at, the, at Disney and Disney was struggling and struggling and struggling. And he had a phenomenal impact. And he was, you know, um, of course, it hasn't done as well since he's got since he's left. But um, but management can be one one big reason. And then we had the uh, we had the uh, consumers staple stocks. These stocks were boring stocks, and everybody hated them because their products were boring. And but all of a sudden, it was this was a period 10, 15 years ago. Globals just starting to get popular, and they, only five percent of their business was international. And uh, but that was growing about five times faster than everything else. And so that was the lead in. And so we made money on Unilever and uh, Kimberly Clark and three or four others, you know, stocks on ilk because their international business went from 5% to 50% over the next two or three years. Um, so it can be a lot, a, lot of different, a lot of different things. What would you say are the top three qualities that you're looking for in a good management team? If you could kind of bottle that up. I think management team itself is, do you have confidence in them? Do you have confidence that they can do the job? Um, two, you're looking for companies, not necessarily ready to that, but companies that have less debt. And then you're looking for, is there a story with the, with the industry? You know, is there something going on in the industry that, you know, can, can, can catch on? Um, some other new product, you know, new markets. Uh, so it's a combination of those three. So it's not specifically just the one thing with a company. It's a combination. Do you have any favorability towards founder-led companies? Not necessarily, no. Love spinoffs. If you catch spinoffs, usually they're smaller companies. But uh, we have in the book Jaguar. I mean, Jaguar was spun off from British Leland. British Leland was a big conglomerate car company. And they spun off Jaguar. So all of a sudden, Jaguar is an independent company. Always had lousy results with their cars, performance. And the guy named Jack Egan took over. And uh, he just did a phenomenal job focusing on that company. It's hard to focus on if it's Jaguar is one of five or six different companies. You know, it's hard to get the focus. But this guy focused on just that and turned it around and it was a big stock. And uh, they wound up selling out. We own that stock at $2 a share. Ford bought it at like 15. Ford made the mistake though. Our feeling was what Ford would do. Our feeling was that Ford will take put a Jaguar in every single one of their dealerships, which would be a huge number. And then people would go into the Ford dealerships, look at the Jaguar and say, wow, wouldn't this be a great car? But I can't afford it. So let me buy the Thunderbird. <laughs> they, didn't, they never took advantage of that. They didn't take advantage of it. I don't know. What, and Ford floated, I mean, Jaguar floated around with these other um, companies, what have you. And it was never, it was never properly used. But the concept was phenomenal, I thought. I, I wanted to go back. I mean, you mentioned the idea of the three-point fix, but I wanted to ask you if you could go back and talk about, because I think it's pretty cool when you, as you described in the book, where the concept originated from. And and then you can talk about, and, that, and I'd like you to kind of flush out a little bit more how you apply it to selecting stocks. Well, where the con concept came from, the Navy, you're on an aircraft carrier, going into a harbor, it's completely fogged in. You can't see anything. You get a one-point navigational fix off a lighthouse, say. Chances are you're going to be successful. So that, in a way, is like buying a low-peak stock, period. You know, um, 
But then if you get another buoy, you can shoot off of that, you get two fixes. So that's like adding a story to the valuation. And then the ideal thing in navigational terms, to get the third fix, you get the third fix, you go into the harbor, no matter how fogged in you are, you're going to be successful. And that's where you get something that's out of favor, as well as the other two. And that's where that came from. So we're always looking for, the analysts will come to me and say, I think stock's a great stock. And so I said, well, what's the chart look like on that thing? And uh, it's like, this, you know, I said, well, that's not what we're looking for. It's been discovered already. You know. um, so you look at where if you can find something out of favor, uh, then you've got the, you got, it's pretty hard to lose at that case. I love that analogy, though, coming into Harvard, it's all fogged in and, you know, you get that three point fix and then you can come in, you know, you're, you're not going to you're not going to crash the crash the ship. Um, so in fact, we, how we got into that was we went back and we said, OK, what are the best stocks we've had? You're always trying to figure out where your best ideas came from. And so he came away with the conclusion that that was sort of the quality of the stocks that were the thousand percent stock gainers were the ones that they're out of favor as well as having the other parts. And um, so then we go back and we started doing more and more work on that. So then it became a part of the whole research process. One of the big challenges for many investors is when to sell a stock. A lot of investors are good at buying, but selling becomes a challenge. Like what's the sell strategy? What's the sell discipline? So how do you guys think about the framework of selling in your process? Well, conceptually we say, uh, we buy something at 3% weighting. If it doubles, and it goes up to 6% weighting, and it's still, valuation still fits, we'll still cut it back to 3%. Um, and if it goes up to say 6%, and it's marginally cheap yet, um, then we start to look for something that we can substitute for it. We're always looking for something cheaper than what we already own. And so sometimes you can't find anything that you want, in a, in a, say maybe a separate industry. So sometimes things will stay in the portfolio probably longer than they should when they're a little more expensive. But basically we're looking to sell stocks and once they get once they get higher than a market multiple. And uh, and then also once the yield gets below one and a half percent, say. Um, those are the two things we're looking for as a sell signal. How about the uh, the other side of that coin? So when you invest in a company and it doesn't do well um, and it's going down, how do, how do you think about sort of evaluating like your initial thesis for investing in it relative to what's happening? Um, you know, in a situation where maybe you haven't made money and, you know, it's, it's one of those mistakes in the portfolio. Well, it's also always an ongoing process. So if you find, so what can we sell? Let's say there's something that's gone up a lot or something that we're tired of looking at. Uh, but we did do one study where, where things went against us and uh, stocks that dropped more than, say, 30, 40 percent and much worse than the market. And uh, <clears throat> we found that if we had book value behind, that's where book value came in handy. Uh, and yield. Um, chances are those stocks we shouldn't have sold them. If you had a low PE, book, book value, and yield, then we should have held on to the stocks because later on they're a lot higher. Um, if the stock had, if it wasn't working, and you had more too much debt, and if you had a management change, especially, that's sort of the combination that will get you to sell. Um, I mean, sometimes you just make a mistake. We had uh, um, one of the oil, well, oil drilling companies, which the uh, Tishes owned. And Larry Tish was a great value guy, loved dividends, stock was cheap. Everybody on Wall Street loved it. We got sucked, it was about 6.5% dividend yield. And we sort of got sucked into it. And it was a, they had the best rigs uh, discipline of anybody around. So it was the best quality of the group. But the group was lousy, <laughs> and um, and then some of the other businesses they were in were not working out. So we got bagged in that, and that was a mistake. So then just we finally realized that there were other things than what everybody was focusing on that were wound up being a problem. Plus, it's over. Kurt Wolf was the analyst at DLJ, who we relied on for, and I called them on the stock, and I said, "Kurt, I says well, this stock looks really cheap. It's got a high dividend yield, whatever." He says, "That's an oil service company." He says. They're not investment stocks. <laughs> he was right. We should have never bought it. <laughs> They're trading stocks. You, he said, you trade what you, you change what you're doing? Is it trading now? <laughs> he was right. I mean, one of the things I, my, my sense here is that there's a degree of 
humbleness, you know, with you and the firm and, you know, you're willing to, I think, admit when, you know, uh, uh, investing mistake was made. I mean, if you look at even the best investors out there, you know, they're only hitting whatever 60, 65 percent, maybe 70 percent winning, winning accuracy in the portfolio, you know, winning position. So that's the thing with investing. It's, you know, you have to understand you could do all the research in the world and there could just be something out there that you didn't see, you didn't realize and that, you know, it doesn't work out. But it doesn't mean that a good investment process isn't a good investment process if you can stay disciplined to it. Right. Yeah. And uh, if you have a stock that's on a low multiple, it gives you more downside protection if you're wrong. <laughs> but that doesn't guarantee you it's going to work out. That's for sure. So we have a standard closing question we like to ask all of our guests. Um, and that is this. Based on your experience in the markets and your research, if you could impart one piece of wisdom or teach one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? Probably um, work on your kids and get them interested in a discipline strategy uh, when they're younger so that when they become a millennial like I was and like you have going on right now, they have a second perspective to what's going on in investing. So it's not a black and white thing. I think what happens is, when you're, I mean, the way we were, I mean, it was a color TV stocks, it was Pan Am, it was the, uh, I mean, and the, uh, you know, all the hot stocks of the, that era, all the growth stocks. And we, 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 we didn't want to invest in anything else. That was all we wanted to invest in. And, uh, but I think it's good to have some balance. So I think people should try to educate their children and what have you um, to have a little balance in the whole investment program. You can still trade if you want to, but make sure you have some balance. That's great. Well, Jack and I both have young kids, so that's a, that's a very unique uh, answer to that question because we've asked dozens of people that, and you're the first to, um, share that wisdom with us. So we certainly appreciate it. We had that in the back of the book. You saw that we had the, the, the 15, 14 year old paper boy or paper girl, <laughs> the compounding, how the compounding works. And the kids will understand that. <laughs> you mean I have a million dollars when I'm 15? <laughs> That's great, Jim. Well, all the best with the book and hopefully the publication is one of the seeds for a long-term turn in value investing. So thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.